I'll show you how to measure compression ratio in this video. I'll be demonstrating on a two-stroke, but a lot of the information applies to four-strokes as well. Before getting started, let me briefly explain compression ratios so we're clear about what is being measured and calculated. Compression ratio is a ratio that relates the volume above the piston at bottom dead center, or the very bottom of the stroke, to the volume above the piston at top dead center, or the very top of the stroke. To make it simple, when the piston is at the bottom of its stroke, there's a lot of room above it for air and fuel. As the piston rises to the top of the bore, it compresses the air and fuel into a much smaller space. The compression ratio tells you how much the air and fuel are being compressed at the top of the stroke. For example, if you have 100 cc of volume above the piston at the bottom of its stroke, and 10 cc above the piston at the top of its stroke, the engine would be compressing the mixture at a ratio of 10 to 1. If you had 150 cc at bottom dead center compressed into the same 10 cc at top dead center, then the ratio would change to 15 to 1. The higher the first number is, the higher the compression ratio is. Everyone seems to want high compression, but why? High compression ratios can improve efficiency, which helps your engine make better use of the fuel that it's fed. Internal combustion engines transform the chemical energy from fuel into mechanical energy that pushes the piston, rotates the crankshaft, and ultimately powers a vehicle or does some other form of work. Improving the efficiency of this conversion means that we can make better use of the energy that the fuel contains and create more power or even decrease fuel consumption. Once we hear that high compression can improve output and fuel efficiency, then the question is, why don't we just aim for the highest compression that we can get? The limitation that most will notice is detonation, or spark knock. High compression ratios not only increase the pressure in the cylinder, but also heat. Pressure and heat can affect flame speed and change ignition timing requirements. As compression ratio rises, the likelihood of detonation increases. Retarding ignition timing and or using higher octane fuel may alleviate knock, but they have limitations, and most true street vehicles would be inconvenient and expensive to operate if relying on racing fuel. Added heat can also be too much for the cooling system to cope with, and in extreme cases can lead to pre-ignition where the mixture ignites before the spark plug fires. You create more mechanical stress with high compression, meaning it's harder on engine components. Many sources also say that compression ratio increases have diminishing returns that make ratios above 14 to 17 to 1, depending on the source and the application, very impractical. In reality, most of us with real street engines won't want that much compression. Typical daily driving capable street engines generally max out around 10 to 12 to 1 compression ratios, but it can vary. Things like combustion chamber design, fuel quality, bore size, engine cooling, and much more can impact exactly what each engine can cope with before the limits of pump gas are reached. Small bore and high revving engines may be usable for street duty with higher numbers. For example, a scooter engine with a 40 mm bore that revs out to 10,000 RPM may work well with 13 to 1 compression on pump gas, while a big V8 with a 4 inch bore that peaks at around 6,000 RPM will likely find that 13 to 1 is a bit much. What I've talked about up to this point is more specifically called static compression ratio, or I often refer to it as uncorrected compression ratio when dealing with a two stroke for reasons that I'm about to explain. Static compression ratio represents sort of an ideal situation where the cylinder is a completely sealed space for the entirety of the piston's movement where none of the volume inside could escape. This is not really how it goes in most engines. Both two strokes and four strokes have ports and valves that are opened and closed as the engine rotates. In a two stroke, all of the ports are uncovered when the piston is at the bottom of its stroke and they remain open until the piston travels far enough toward top dead center to cover them. The actual closing point will vary from engine to engine, but the exhaust port or ports will be the last to be covered, allowing the cylinder to seal. Four-stroke engines use valves that open and close to let fuel and air in and to allow exhaust gases to escape. 
The intake valve opens so mixture can enter the cylinder, and it remains open even as the piston begins to make its way back up the bore on the compression stroke. In this case, the cylinder isn't sealed off so the mixture can be compressed without escaping until the intake valve closes. In both two strokes and four strokes, many prefer to use this type of corrected compression ratio when setting up their engines instead of the static compression ratio because it tells more about the actual cylinder pressures. The effects of port or valve timing are taken into consideration using this method, so exhaust ports with long durations in two strokes, or a big cam that keeps intake valves open longer when the piston is higher in the bore during the compression stroke on four strokes, will cause lower numbers. This is commonly referred to as dynamic compression ratio, though I tend to call it corrected compression ratio when dealing with a two-stroke. Dynamic compression ratio numbers are lower than static compression ratio numbers, with 8 to 8.5 to 1 often used as an upper limit for street vehicles. In addition to static and dynamic, or uncorrected and corrected compression ratio, some also use what is called effective, or boost compression ratio, for engines with positive manifold pressure from superchargers or turbines. Effective compression ratio is typically just a calculation based on static compression ratio and boost pressure with a formula that I'll show you in a moment. Limitations for effective compression ratio tend to be pretty similar to those of static compression ratio for pump gas powered street vehicles. To find effective compression ratio, boost pressure in PSI is added to 14.7, which is atmospheric pressure in PSI. Then that sum is divided by 14.7 and the square root is found. The square root is then multiplied by static compression ratio to solve for effective compression ratio. So in this example, you can see that an engine with 9 to 1 static compression with 8 pounds of boost has an effective compression ratio of about 11.2 to 1. Okay, so now hopefully you have a basic understanding of what compression ratio is. So let's take a look at how you can take measurements and do the math to calculate compression specs for your engine. First I want to show you how to measure the static compression ratio of an engine. Here's a list of the specs that you'll need to know to calculate static compression ratio. I'll start by going down the list to show you how to measure and find all of these values beginning with cylinder bore. You may be able to find bore and stroke and maybe even displacement information for stock and other engines in documentation or online, and if you're building an engine with a larger bore or stroke, you are likely already aware of these specs. It's still not a bad idea to measure though, to be sure everything is as it's supposed to be. Cylinder bore is the diameter of the cylinder, and it's pretty easy to measure accurately enough for our purposes. A measurement with a caliper as shown should be fine. Make sure the cylinder is clean before you measure with no carbon buildup that could skew results. Position the caliper straight across the bore, parallel with the top of the cylinder, and move it around to find the largest number. Repeat this a couple of times to make sure your measurement is correct, and if it varies by much, you may need to retry until each measurement is close to the other. You may even want to take the average of three measurements for the best accuracy. You could also use snap gauges and a micrometer or a dial bore gauge to find cylinder bore, but again I think the caliper will get you close enough for most purposes and is something that more people own. Make a note of the bore measurement that you've came up with. I'm going to record my bore and other specs here so I can show you an entire example of the process. Now we can move on to finding the stroke. Stroke is the distance that the piston travels between bottom dead center and top dead center or the total distance that the crankshaft moves the piston up or down the bore. Move the piston to the very bottom of its stroke, bottom dead center. You can use a degree wheel to be sure you're at bottom dead center, but if you can't push the piston down any further, you should be there. Then you can use a depth gauge or caliper to measure stroke. Extend the caliper or depth gauge out and zero it with a base flat against the cylinder's deck and the tip against the top of the piston. With a depth gauge, you can measure from the center easily, but with a caliper you'll need to take your measurement from the edge of the piston crown. After the gauge is zeroed, rotate the engine slowly all the way to the top of the stroke. You can stop at top dead center if you're using a degree wheel, or just rotate slightly beyond what you think is top dead center. This won't ruin your measurement because the piston will just begin to move back down the bore if you go a little too far. 
Take note of the measurement and then repeat this at least twice more. Stroke can be tricky to get a very accurate measurement of, especially with a caliper, so don't skip the rechecks and again you can average measurements to improve accuracy. In this case I got just a hair over 45 millimeters and my crank is listed as 45 millimeter stroke so I just used 45 millimeters for my spec. Now we know the bore and stroke of the engine so we can use those to calculate displacement. Here's the formula and you can see that we actually need to know bore radius instead of diameter. That's easy enough because radius is half of the diameter so just divide the bore diameter measurement by 2 to find radius. I use 3.14159 as pi, but you can use more decimal places if you'd like. Once it's all filled in, we can start to solve. I'm not qualified to be a math teacher, but I did show my steps so you can see how the process should go. In my case, my displacement equals 102.87 cc after being rounded off to two decimal places. You can leave it in long form, but I don't think most of us will take every measurement accurately enough that it will matter in the end. Next we need to figure out the head gasket volume, so we need to measure the head gasket's bore and thickness. Measure the head gasket's bore just as you did for the cylinder bore and make a note of it. Now you need to know the head gasket thickness. What you really want to know is the compressed thickness, because most gaskets will compress and become thinner once torqued and used. If you're working on more mainstream or popular engines, like an automotive engine for example, you can probably find compressed thickness specifications from the manufacturer for the gasket that you're using. If you can't find that info, you'll have to try to measure it. What works as a close enough kind of number for many is to measure a used gasket that is the same as what you'll be using. Some prefer to install the gasket and torque the head down and then try to measure the gap between the head and the cylinder. I've heard of others putting solder or clay in either an unused hole in the head gasket or drilling a small hole in an area where it should not affect sealing for the clay or solder. Then the head can be torqued down and when removed the clay or solder should let you measure how thin the gasket got. After you have the head gasket's bore and thickness, you can calculate its volume using the same equation that was used for displacement with stroke being replaced by thickness. For this example, the gasket had a 55.3 mm bore and a 0.73 mm thickness, which came out to a volume of 1.75 cc once rounded off. That was just an example to show the process of coming up with a head gasket volume. The engine that I was working on in the video used O-rings for sealing, so I recorded my head gasket volume as zero. Now we need to find the deck clearance. That's the distance that the piston's crown is from the cylinder's deck when at top dead center. Rotate the engine so that the piston is at top dead center. Again, you'll either need a degree wheel attached or to make sure that the piston is at the highest point in the bore with measurements. In my opinion, the whole process is easier if a degree wheel is set up at the very beginning. Measure the distance that the piston crown sits either above or below the cylinder. You can do this multiple ways, but calipers or depth gauge work well and they're tools that we've already been using. If using calipers, you'll want to take this measurement at the very edge of the bore and piston. With a depth gauge, you can measure from the edge or the center point of the piston or anywhere that the piston has a flat deck. You will need to take another related measurement later so it's important to make sure you can repeat the measurement location. You could even make a mark on the piston to note where the measurement was done. If your piston sits below the deck, this is called positive clearance and the number should be noted as normal or you can put a plus sign beside it. If the piston sits above the deck, it's called negative clearance and you should note it as a negative number with a minus sign beside it. It's important to know which it is for proper calculations. Once the clearance is known, we can figure out the volume above the piston to deck at top dead center. This is done just like the displacement calculation, but using the deck clearance as the stroke. If your piston happens to have exactly zero clearance, meaning it's perfectly flush or even with the cylinder deck, then you can skip the math and record a zero for the volume above the piston to deck at top dead center. In my case, the piston sat 0.15 millimeters below the deck in a 53.95 millimeter bore, which came out to 0.34 cc.
Note your result and we can move on to the last couple of measurements that we'll take, both of which will be volumes using fluid to measure. Let's start by finding the volume of the combustion chamber in the head. Some may be able to find the combustion chamber info from the manufacturer, but the rest of us will have to measure. You'll need a couple of items that you may not normally have on hand. First you'll need a sheet of plexiglass or Lexan larger than the footprint of the head's mating surface. I used 8 inch thick plexiglass because it was available at the hardware store that I visited, but you can use thicker material if you'd like. I would not go any thinner than 8 inch. You may notice that the plexiglass that I used to measure had holes in it that matched the cylinder stud holes, but those are not necessary. In fact, bolting down the plate could cause some warping and inaccuracy in the measurements that we'll take. You will need a hole over the bore area in the plexiglass so fluid can be added. It's best to drill this hole away from the center because that will make it easier to get rid of air bubbles while you're filling the head with fluid. You will also need some way to measure fluid volume, the cheapest and easiest being a graduated syringe that you should be able to find in a local pharmacy. Using a burette or pipette may increase the accuracy of your measurements, but they are more expensive and may not be as easy to find locally, though they aren't hard to get online. You'll also need a liquid to use for the measurement. Some use automatic transmission fluid, but I just use water with a few drops of food coloring. Food coloring isn't totally necessary, but it makes it much easier to see if there are air pockets compared to using just clear water. Install a spark plug in the head. It should be the same style of plug that you plan to use, because differences in reach or design can change the results of your volume test. Then find a way to support the head so that the combustion chamber faces up. For small heads, a couple of 2x4s could work. Larger heads will need something more substantial and secure. Apply a thin film of grease around the mating surface of the head, or just around the edge of the combustion chamber, to act as a seal. You don't need very much, and excess should be avoided because it could squeeze out into the chamber and skew results. Place the plexiglass over the chamber. If your head is not sitting totally flat, then place it so the hole over the chamber is at the highest point. This will make it easier to get rid of air bubbles. Now you can slowly fill the combustion chamber with fluid from your measuring device. If you see air pockets forming, you may need to tilt the head to get them to rise to the opening in the plate, or sometimes a gentle tap will get them moving. Fill until you no longer see any air pockets. If you can't get rid of one or more air pockets, or if you spill any fluid along the way, you will need to clean everything up and try again. If you have any leaks, that's another reason to redo the test. If you have a four stroke and it leaks around the valves, you may need to put a film of grease around the valve or seat to help it seal. Once the chamber is completely filled, note the amount of fluid that was used. Make sure that you know how to properly read the device that you're using to measure. For example, if using a burette or pipette, you should measure from the meniscus rather than from the top of the fluid level. In my example, it looks like 11.1 cc if you were to measure at the very top of the fluid level, but the proper measurement is taken at the bottom of the meniscus at 11.2 cc. I would suggest repeating this test at least once more, preferably twice more, and then averaging the results for accuracy. Make sure everything is totally clean and dry before you start the volume measurement process over. Any leftover fluid will throw off results. Now we need to find the piston crown displacement. You may be able to find dish or dome volume for some applications, but if not, it isn't too tough to measure. I install the piston rings for this task because their resistance will help to hold the piston in place while measuring. Slide the piston into the bore and push it somewhere near the top. It needs to be low enough that no part of the piston sits above the deck. Don't install it too low though, because we'll be adding liquid, much like we did for the combustion chamber measurement, and having the piston low in the bore requires more fluid than we need to use. Use a thin film of grease to seal around the edges of the piston. Again, too much will take up space and throw off our volume measurement. Next, measure the depth of the piston in the bore. 
Earlier you should have measured the deck clearance of the piston. Use the same measuring method and spot as you did before. So if you measured at the edge of the piston, measure at the edge now, or if you measured from the center, measure from the center now. This will ensure greater accuracy in our compression measurement. From this point on, be very careful not to move the piston. It is important to know the depth of the piston when the volume is checked, so you would either need to start over or remeasure before or after the volume check is completed if the piston moves. Set the cylinder up so it's vertical or near vertical, and use a film of grease to seal around the bore and set the plexiglass in place just like you did when measuring the combustion chamber. Fill the space above the piston until there are no air pockets, and then note the volume of liquid. If you find that any liquid leaks, you will need to repeat the test after resealing around the piston and rechecking the piston depth. This volume check may be repeated, but do not average the results unless you set the piston at the exact same depth each time. Cleaning and drying the bore is likely to move the piston, and I find it just as easy to do my averaging another way later instead of trying to reset the piston into the exact position each time. Record piston depth and volume of fluid for each test that you do. Now we need to use a little math to figure out the piston crown displacement. Once again, we're going back to our trusty displacement formula. But this time, we'll use the piston's depth at the time of the volume measurement for the stroke. That number is the volume of fluid that should have been above the piston when installed at the depth used for the test, if the piston were totally flat. Now we can find the difference between that number and the fluid volume that we measured. If your calculated number is greater than the measured number, subtract the measured number from the calculated number and the result is your piston ground displacement. In this case, it would be a negative volume because it takes up space. If your calculated number is less than the measured number, subtract the calculated number from the measured volume to find crown displacement. In this case, it would be a positive volume because it adds space to the trap volume. If you made multiple volume checks, you can average the results of the crown displacement now. Doing the averaging at this point allows you to work with results accurately even if tests were done at different piston depths. Record the piston crown displacement, and now you should have the information required to find your trapped volume. Trapped volume is the total volume above the piston at top dead center that takes into account the combustion chamber, head gasket, volume above the piston to deck, and the piston crown displacement. Here's the formula to calculate the trap volume, but I need to point out a couple of things. You should notice that I have put plus or minus ahead of both the volume above piston to deck at top dead center and piston crown displacement. This is because how you handle those numbers depends on if they are adding or subtracting volume to the trapped volume. If the piston sits above deck, so it has a negative deck clearance, then it is taking volume away from the trap volume and it should be subtracted. If the piston sits below deck, a positive deck clearance, then it adds volume, so it should be added in the formula. The same holds true for piston crown displacement. If the piston has a dome or crown that takes up room above the piston, a negative displacement, it needs to be subtracted in the formula. And if the piston has a dish or valve reliefs that add space above the piston, a positive displacement, then the piston crown displacement needs to be added in the equation. Hopefully that makes sense. Basically you just need to understand if something adds or subtracts volume above the piston and adjust accordingly. In my example, the piston sat below the deck, so I added the volume above the piston to deck at top dead center, and the piston crown took up space so I subtracted its volume and I ended up with an 8.4 cc trapped volume. Once you know the trapped volume, you should have everything you need to calculate the static compression ratio. The formula for this is very simple. The hard part has been getting here. All you need to do is add displacement and trap volume and then divide the result by the trap volume. When you think about that for a second, you're taking the total volume above the piston when it's at the bottom of its stroke and dividing it by the total volume above it at the top of its stroke, and that tells you how much the bottom dead center volume is compressed to fit into the top dead center volume. In my example, the engine has about a 13.19 to 1 static compression ratio. That's not the end of the story though, because I still want to find the dynamic or corrected compression ratio.
Having all of the information from the static compression calculation, finding the corrected or dynamic compression ratio is just a matter of taking one more measurement and a little more math. Corrected or dynamic stroke needs to be measured so corrected or dynamic displacement can be calculated, but the process is a little bit different for two and four stroke engines. I'll start by showing you how it's done on a two stroke. The distance from top dead center to the roof or top of the exhaust port needs to be found and that will be the corrected stroke for a two stroke engine. You can do this just like you measured for deck clearance or how you measured for the stroke. So you can either measure from the deck down to the top of the exhaust port or measure the distance that the piston travels from the top of the exhaust port to top dead center. Either way works fine, but if you choose to measure from the deck down, then you should add or subtract deck clearance from that measurement. When measuring to or from the exhaust port roof, you may have a chamfer or bevel that blends the port into the cylinder. Take your measurement from the top of the port rather than the top of the chamfer. Some prefer to do this measurement with the piston installed and use the point where they can just start to see the light from a flashlight coming through as the port roof. I just used a caliper to measure from deck to the exhaust port roof so I had to subtract the deck clearance to get my corrected stroke of 23.85 millimeters. The full stroke is 45 millimeters, so for nearly half of that the exhaust port is not allowing the cylinder to be sealed, so you can see how this would affect the compression and pressure within the cylinder. Now I'll show you how to find the dynamic stroke with a four-stroke engine. We need to know when the intake valve closes in order to figure out the dynamic stroke. Aftermarket cams for major applications usually include a cam card that provides information about the camshaft, or at least specs are published in catalogs or online. One of those specs should be intake valve closing point, stated in degrees after bottom dead center. These points were measured at a specific amount of valve or tappet lift, and it's important to know how they were measured to make useful comparisons, because there is no single measurement standard for all cams. For example, some manufacturers publish timing events at 50 thousandths of an inch lift. Some may use one millimeter, and others list what is called advertised or seat to seat timing. Advertised timing numbers are usually at a very low lift, most often somewhere between about two thousandths of an inch up to around 20 thousandths of an inch. They're the timing figures that are commonly used for dynamic compression ratio calculation. But again, exactly what spec you're looking for may not be the same from one engine to the next because different valve train setups will be treated differently and cam companies choose their own specs. For example, hydraulic cams may be rated differently than solid lifter cams. And some cams will be rated in tappet lift and others by valve lift. And then there are metric versus standard ratings. This is why it's important to find information specific to your application if you plan to make any comparisons like seeing how a different cam would change your compression. When intake valve closing is given on a cam card, most will find their dynamic compression ratio by simply plugging that information into an online calculator along with whatever other information the calculator requests. It's the easiest way to go as long as you know the specs. Not all applications have the benefit of cam cards and online specs though. One example that I'm familiar with is scooter engines. If you buy a cam for something like a 50 or 150cc scooter, most likely you're going to get a cam with nothing more than claims about it making more power or making your scooter faster. Maybe you'll get lift numbers or occasionally duration numbers, but I've never received a cam for my small scooters that had any specs anywhere like intake valve closing point or anything that would even let me degree the cam. In a situation like this, you have to put in the effort yourself to measure the intake valve closing point if you want to find your dynamic compression ratio. The first thing you'll need to do is set up a degree wheel on the engine and find top dead center. If you need help with this, I've got a video all about setting up a degree wheel and I'll put a link in the description. Then you should adjust your valves to zero lash instead of the standard clearance unless your engine will be measured directly from the lobe or lifter because you don't want that slop when taking measurements. In case you aren't familiar with it, zero lash is just zero clearance. You don't want it set so tightly that the valve is trying to open, but just enough that there is no play. Now you'll need to set up a dial indicator to measure intake lift. 
In this case, I indicated from the retainer and was careful to keep the indicator aligned parallel with the valve the best I could. It's also important to make sure that there is no interference with the indicator through the entire range of travel and that there is enough travel to measure the lift that the cam or valve is capable of. Zero the indicator when the valve is totally closed, so you'll be on the base circle of the lobe that you're measuring. Rotating the engine to top dead center between the compression and power stroke is an easy way to do this. Once zeroed, rotate the engine so the valve opens and closes a few times and make sure the indicator returns to zero every time. Now you're ready to find the intake valve closing point. Well, almost. You will need to decide on a valve lift spec to measure at. For example, do you want to find the closing point at two thousandths of an inch, or at ten thousandths of an inch, or at 0.1 millimeter, and so on. My best suggestion is to try to decide based on other applications relevant to yours, or at least pick a number and stick to it for any setup that you measure, and that way you'll have a standard for your own project. If you're trying to measure a stock cam or an unknown cam to compare to a cam that you have specs for, measure in whatever way the known cam is measured for easiest comparison. If you do choose your own spec, use at least two thousandths of an inch. I chose to go with four thousandths of an inch here, but I measured at multiple points just to give you an idea of how this can affect your numbers and why it's important to use a standard if possible. There's also no reason that you can't measure valve closing at multiple points like I did to have them around in case they're of use for any future comparisons. Once you decide on a figure, you can find your intake valve closing point. Rotate the engine in its normal direction of rotation. If you're not certain which way the engine should rotate, you can just watch the valves. When rotating in the proper direction, the exhaust valve will open and then the intake will open before the exhaust valve is totally closed, which is the period of overlap. If you see the intake valve open and then the exhaust valve opens before it closes, you're going the wrong way. Rotate the crank until the intake valve begins to open and your dial indicator should start moving to show lift as the valve opens. Keep rotating slowly until the dial indicator peaks and then starts going the other way, which will tell you that the valve is closing. Go very slowly and watch the dial as you approach the number that you've planned to measure. Stop when the indicator shows the lift value that you were aiming for. In this case, it was four thousandths of an inch. If you go past your target, either rotate the engine all the way around and try again, or rotate backwards at least one hundred thousandths of an inch on the dial indicator before turning it forward again to avoid errors from slack in the cam chain. When the dial indicator is on the lift number that you want it on, check the timing on the degree wheel. This will be your intake valve closing point and should be noted in degrees after bottom dead center. Some wheels, like the one I'm using, have multiple timing marks. You can count the degrees to bottom dead center from that point, or it may be helpful to watch the wheel as it rotates in the proper direction. After recording the degrees after bottom dead center and the lift that it was measured at, repeat the process at least twice more for accuracy and average the numbers if they don't match. If your numbers are way off, something is wrong, so reevaluate what you're doing and start over. Once you know the intake valve closing degrees, you can find the dynamic stroke and compression with an online calculator, but I prefer to measure the dynamic stroke for myself because it's pretty simple while the degree wheel is still set up. Disassemble the engine enough to set it up as if you were going to measure the stroke as shown earlier in the video. Then set the degree wheel to the number that you noted for the intake valve closing point. In my example, it was 69 degrees after bottom dead center, and you can see that I marked my degree wheel with a red dry erase marker at that point just to make it obvious. By setting the degree wheel to the intake valve closing point, you're setting the piston at the bottom of its dynamic stroke. What that means is that you can now treat this like a standard stroke measurement and measure from the piston to deck and add or subtract your deck clearance to find the dynamic stroke, or measure travel from that point to top dead center to find dynamic stroke. Again, repeat and average this measurement for accuracy and you've found the dynamic stroke. Once dynamic or corrected stroke is known, we can calculate the dynamic or corrected displacement. Use the displacement formula, but put the corrected stroke in place of the full stroke. In my example, I'm working with the two strokes numbers, and the corrected displacement was 54.52 cc. Now dynamic or corrected compression ratio can be calculated using the same formula as static compression ratio, but this time substituting the corrected displacement for displacement. 
I ended up with 7.46 to 1, significantly less than my static ratio of 13.19 to 1. All of this information can be used to decide if changes should be made to your setup, but I tend to primarily use the corrected or dynamic compression ratio to influence any adjustments. For example, I tend to use 7 to 8 to 1 corrected as a target for my two strokes, and this particular engine fell right in the center of that, so I assembled it without further modification. Remember that compression targets listed here are just commonly used guidelines, and it's always best to research your engine platform and find information from builders and tuners familiar with it. I should also note that opinions vary on the usefulness of knowing these ratios. These numbers are definitely not the end of the story for engine building and planning, but I think they're good tools for comparison and concepts that are helpful if understood. As I wrap this up, the next screens will show formulas from the video for a quick reference, as well as some unit conversion info. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more.